Hello and welcome to the Insights Overflow podcast, the show where we talk to customers, partners, and industry leaders about the lessons that they've learned in order to make an impact. Today, I'm joined by Andre Strauss, who's the co-founder and CEO of Cohesion X. Welcome, Andre. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So, you know, we go back some time. Uh, you know, your time at IIT Nexus, chief commercial officer. So. Maybe you can just describe to me your journey over the last couple of years from when you met those years ago. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think next was a remarkable journey for all of us involved. Um, I mean, it's one of those things that um, find your career for, for me definitely did. You know, I started the, about nine years ago. It was a really small company field for five people with almost our gig. But for me, um, uh, you you're part of that startup vibe, and it um, it's a very int- intense journey. I mean, you grow as a as a person, and um, and there comes a time when you have to move on. So last year, I made the decision towards the end of last year that it's time for me to try something else. So um, I sadly left the business, um, and then this thing happened. So it was it was a um, it was a amazing story. We. Um, set out myself and, and some like-minded individuals to um, create a new a new venture for ourselves. We immediately um, uh, got hooked into a project with agricultural guys that tried to build generative AI in agriculture, which is which is a really good use case to try and assist farmers in their own language across Africa and give them access to to information. So they sort of like put the thing together, and we immediately got excited. I was really excited about that. So um, uh, we bought the technology from them and then took over and started building a platform from it. So I took a lot of the people that's over the years supported me from, from developers to, um, to investors and we really grabbed that project and built a product out of it which is now called VectorMind. Um, and it was, a, it was an amazing journey from, from the previous IT type world into this, um, this revolution in, in um, generative AI. So, that's where we are today. It's a year later, and it's going really, really well. We've got um, we've got thousands of users on our platform already, um, and the adoption rate of of AI is just something else. So it is you have to buckle up and hold on because it's going really fast, and it's really exciting stuff. So I mean, coming from sort of the IoT space, and I'm moving into the AI space. Like, you know, you obviously like cutting edge technology. You know, what is it about being at the sort of bleeding edge of what's possible in technology that excites you? What, you know, how have you found yourself always within the next, let's call it, um, enterprise cycle of new emergent technologies? It's actually a little bit different for me personally that the two technologies, both are exponential technologies, most definitely. Um, IT was a very personal thing for me from, um, from a young age, I enjoyed to understand and figure out stuff. Now, IT is a very practical thing because you plug into trucks and equipment and machinery, and I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed understanding how things get together and then bringing technology into it. And then by nature, I am a salesman, so I was able to articulate it well, and I think that's why I was very successful in the IT space. So that was, but it's also a, a, a very disruptive technology and exponential technology. Um, whereas, whereas Gen AI is, is something completely different. So I think maybe this journey was more the people that surrounded me um, and, and having spent the past 25 years of my life in um, technology um, and being uh, a bit of a tinkerer, um, it, I just immediately took to it. So I think um, that was for me the next thing. Um, I immediately see, saw the value because Gen AI is probably the biggest leap that we've seen in the past 30 years in technology. It's so big that it's bigger than the technology age and the information age. I think this is a new age of intelligence because um, the way that people engage with systems and I'm and, and, um, uh, thinking about Oculus and the way that people engage with data is fundamentally changing. It, it opened up access to information in a way, these language models that was previously simply not possible. And I think that's extremely exciting and that's why I immediately saw the benefit that we can bring to people. And I also saw the, the risks involved um, and which we can talk a little bit about, but I saw that there's um, being um, such a 
big new step and making it so easy for anybody to access information um, provides a, lo a lot of risk now and we immediately saw there's an opportunity for us to almost package it in a way that makes it safe for business. Um, so I don't think I necessarily chose exponential technologies, it's the journey I'm on, the people that surround me and the world that we operate in that just opened this door for us and, um, and I think we had the experience to package it in a way that immediately makes sense from a business perspective. Yeah, I think one of the things like we've seen even in our business, you, know, you, can, you can have a great idea and you can have a product, but then you need to commercialize it, you need to sell it. So, I mean, obviously you've spent a lot of your time in the, the sales end of the technology and, you know, people don't necessarily get a sense of what it means to sell an enterprise deal, how long it takes, the players involved, you know, so like how, how do you go from idea product and then actually commercialize it and sell it, you know, like what's unique about like enterprise sales that, you know, you think you've, you've got that, that gift to sort of translate that and commercialize things? Yeah, I would like to believe it's a gift. I think it's um, also experience in making lots of mistakes. Um, my partner wants to write the book that he wants to call a gazillion. Um, and it's mostly a gazillion mistakes that we made. So I think we, we had the opportunity to really over the years evolve our, uh, um, our skills and our offer and understanding what enterprise is looking for. Um, it is the perfect culmination because we've already commercialized this product. Um, like I said, we've got thousands of actual users, commercial users on our platform as it stands now. And that's just good timing and that experience to package it. Um, and I think um, there's, there's obviously a whole podcast in the way that how enterprise buys technology and what makes people buy it. I think that the combination of this wave of, of generative AI, this just this absolute um, technology flood that's coming in, um, enterprises and businesses are, are really eager to try and use it and try and make it part of their business and unlock value, but they're looking for partners to do that. And I think we, we found a sweet spot in the way that we package the product in such a way that you almost immediately get value out of it. So we were able to commercialize this. We did our first um, contract um, within two months of launching with, a, with a, a big Canadian company called TELUS. It's um, one of the global leading telecommunications company in the world. Um, it was a full commercial agreement. Um, we went live with them in um, January. And then from there, we've done several commercial agreements. So we were able to commercialize this product within two or three months, which is unheard of. In my experience, we've never been able to do that. And I think it's testament to just a whole combination of different things. It is. It is the desire for businesses to really adopt Gen AI as part of the um, business and then the experience that we have in this market and, and that's guided us to this point. And in your opinion, what do you think it is about Gen AI that's captured the imagination? Like, I mean, you don't necessarily need to go to a customer and sell the benefits or like inform them as to what it is. The market at large has essentially created the excitement. What do you think it is about Gen AI that's captured everybody? Well, I think it's the unprecedented value that a user immediately gets. You go onto ChatGPT and anybody has got access to concise value almost instantly, which has previously simply not been possible with any sort of technology. And you get real intelligence and, and the evolution of, of these use cases have brought value to traditional users that um, really struggle to unlock value in technology and it's accessible to anybody. It's not just uh, technologists that use this. Um, a study by Microsoft now revealed that 80% of all employees in the US use some form of Gen AI in their daily activities. I mean, where has that ever happened? It is the biggest wave that we've ever seen. Um, and I think um, it's because people unlock value instantly. It, it, it gives you tools and supercharges your productivity in a way that has never been possible with anything out there. No one's got it right. And, um, and because it's, it's almost, um, for most people, it's an it, it's a unknown science, it's just, it just happens and that's the beauty of the user experience that Gen AI, Gen AI brought. You don't have to install a lot of things, it's not a technical thing, you immediately just use it and unlock value. And I think that's driving the adoption and I think then Coupled with that is the risk for executives and businesses to say, well, whether it's like, um, 
one of our customers said that uh, Gen AI is like uh, standing at the beach and trying to stop the waves with your hands. It's just coming, you can't do anything about that. I think that um, understanding by business leaders that um, they have to be in control of this, otherwise it will surround them. Every, all, all employees will use it um, either secretly or irresponsibly and I think that's what's forcing this adoption because people have to be in charge of that. And I think that's really just um, helped drive this adoption because um, the, 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 the uptake is just tremendous at the moment. Yeah, sort of how we um, integrated Gen AI into Oculus is sort of we took the approach to say, okay, cool, well, you know, how do we help our users get value faster through the app? So either build things quicker, get insights into information that they wouldn't ordinarily get. So first and foremost, we took a productivity approach to say, okay, cool, well, the things that are hard in the system like writing SQL, building data models, um, formatting customer HTML, etc. Let's integrate Gen AI into those elements to help a user because they're going to go somewhere else to search anyway. Uh, but then further to that, we said, okay, cool. Well, say you on a dashboard on a piece of information, you know, all of that data is actually has the potential to be available to a Gen AI application, an LLM, to basically say, well, interpret this for me as you know, as a user, as a data analyst. So we've seen it both from like a productivity, improve our product and user experience, as well as enable the customer to get insights just by typing natural language. You know, so I think as, let's call it software providers that aren't, we're not Gen AI creators, we're just leveraging Gen AI to help our own product, help our users on our own platform. So I think people in the software space um, will just sort of continue to use Gen AI to give their users a better and better experience, you know, so. And I think what you just mentioned there for the um, Oculus project and product um, uh, is that the ability for Gen AI to act as that translation is going to unlock the value, I think, for end users of, of the Lumen pro uh, product. Um, uh, the ability and, and also the user's um, expectation is going to change because yes. more and more it's going to be part of their lives. Yes. They're going to speak to applications instead of having to type. They're going to get all, uh, they're going to have some experiences on certain products where it's just absolutely intuitive and you speak to it and you get exactly what you want. And then us as software developers, we're going to have to keep up with that because there will be products that makes it easy. And that's why I think it's so important to create that ability for a business unit user when they want to interrogate their data to do it in natural language instead of having to navigate. And I think that's exactly where you're building your, your translation layer. We focus a lot on that also on our side. It's mostly that translation layer between either structured data, like in the case of Lumen, or a big part of what we do is like unstructured data, documents and PDFs and SharePoint folders and research articles. Um, but Gen AI is essentially that translation layer that makes it absolutely intuitive and easy for anybody to engage with that information, whether structured or unstructured. And I think that it's going to be very much part of, like you said already in your business, it's in your development cycle, it's in your productivity tools, and it's um, in the user experience. That's what it's going to be, I think, for most businesses, and it's going to be a very big part of our lives every day. Yeah, I think one way to envision it is that you've got users on one side that are, let's call it, say, super flexible and unpredictable, and then you've got rigid APIs or say back-end functions and somewhere in the middle something needs to say how do I take these variable inputs and you know massage it into that structure that this back-end expects you know I think that's a lot of where we see the benefits is that you know you can interpret that natural language and you can tell the LLM hey listen this is the output I'm expecting so when you're interpreting the user's input you know, form this output in the structure so that I can use it programmatically down the line. You know, so that sort of interface or gateway is just, yeah, what you can do with that is just incredible. Yeah, and language models just understand what we mean. That's the beauty of this. I understand the intent, whether we make spelling mistakes. Yes. That example you just used, we, um, we went live with one of our retail customers um, in the past week, Wheelie. Um, so you can go to their website and have a look at how that works, but it's exactly what you're saying. You can go to the website and in any language, in Zulu, you can say, I want a large car that I can travel with, it's safe and it's light on fuel. And, 
um, and whatever your criteria is. And then the la language model is just there to try and understand what you're actually looking for and translate that into something that now that structured the, the stock list that we can now go find those items. And that's a real nice use case of how that comes to life. I expect that everything will be like that a year from now or two years from now, where when you want to order on 6060 instead of, um, which they great, I mean, they've revolutionized shopping and almost instant gratification in shopping. But I think the next step there is you're going to send the voice note in Afrikaans and say, I want bread, milk and bananas um, and send it to my normal address. And then the language models and Gen AI will figure out what do you actually mean? And then, like you said, that translation layer to go take it into your profile to figure out what you ordered previously. And I think that's the experience that consumers are going to get. And us as um, product owners and software developers, we're going to have to make sure that we can provide that kind of experience because the consumers are going to want that. And then tell me, say, you know, with VectorMind, um, so is it a platform? Is it like a product? Is there like one particular use case? Like, um, you know, how, how should one envisage what, what it actually does? So our approach with this was a little bit different. So um, we wanted to create a platform, a real platform that handles a lot of the, um, almost the underlying um, functionality for generative AI. So let's think of it in a practical um, example. Um, there's going to be a really big um, uh, move towards responsible AI. And it's not just the buzzword, there's just, there's some realities in the moment you do, you use a software tool where it's a little bit unpredicted, um, unpredictable, you're going to have to put guardrails in place to protect your, your system. So as an example, the, the, the foundation of our platform are, are certain functionalities that protects the business. So let's say we deal with a large law firm, the platform we deploy and then on top of that we'll have the applications like we just discussed. But what does the platform do? So that handles the ethical aspects of AI. In other words, um, it's not um, contrary to popular, popular belief, um, uh, ethics in AI is actually not about bias. It's one of the few elements, but it's more important to know how did you get to an answer? What's the traceability? Are you able to determine what was the source document? How did we get to a certain answer or a certain document? Um, to be able to protect data, to protect privacy, um, to make sure that you, um, that you don't, um, uh, that you stick to, to compliance and, and governance laws in South Africa like Poppy and, and in Europe. So um, all of those, foundational elements in Gen AI is what's encapsulated in our platform. So that we, when we install it and also we then close the loop. So in other words, the system will run on that law firm's data. It's not necessarily open to the internet because they work with confidential information and contracts. We don't want that to, to leak into the, um, the public sphere. So the platform facilitates the foundation for Gen AI. And then on top of that, we have now a lot of applications that runs inside the, the product. Um, and inside the platform. So an application would be an HR assistant. So you would upload all of your smoking policies and payroll policies and um, contracts and all of that stuff. Um, and then you make it available to your, um, to your staff that they can do leave applications, they can pull pay slips in an automated way, they can interrogate the smoking policy or the parking policy or whatever. So that's like one application that runs in the platform. And then we've got one that drafts contracts and we've got one that reviews contracts and then we've got structured queries like the, the one for Wheelie where we would go, um, uh, go implement it in the website. Um, and a bunch of use cases like that, um, very specific ones um, ranging from HR to sales to legal to compliance and those kind of things. Um, and a lot of our customers have made this publicly accessible. So our first, one of, uh, some of our first um, projects were for the South African Agriculture Institute called SAI. And they've got, um, I think, 12,000 members in South Africa. And they then launched a public app to those, to those farmers that runs on the same platform and the same application. But this gives advice on soil analysis. And farmers can ask questions about um, anything from irrigation to pesticides. Um, and it's very practical, focused on them. But the platform we've developed forms the basis. So everything we do in there is traceable. You can see why we, we trace and track why um, and, and give complete transparency on every single interaction that AI has with the system. And that's sort of like why we, why we went um, about building a platform. 
because that then gives the, the company that we work with or the partner that we work with uh, assurance that their data is safe, that we are protected, that we have traceability and that the right systems and guardrails are in place to protect them um, going forward. And I think that's a key aspect to it. So it is, it is fundamentally a Gen AI platform where we have lots of different applications and different use cases to specific industries. Yeah, I think that's the thing is, you know, you, an LLM is sort of general, but how do you make it super specific or hyper specific to either that business's data, you know, their context? You know, yeah. So I think that's definitely the, the gap that, um, that is out there. You know, you've got these sort of large language models out there that are pre-trained on billions of parameters, but they're good at sort of generalized stuff. But then yeah. you know, how do you bring it you know, to the specific um, customer or the context of that customers? And sort of we see the same thing is that, you know, we always um, saw is that my feeling was that there's going to be a land grab of these big LLMs to get closer and closer to the business's data. Because right now it's public internet data, but the next step is to say, okay, cool, it's good for general, but their biggest gap is how do they get closer to the customer systems, um, you know, either through integrations, etc. You know, so I think that's the definitely sort of I see the same gaps as, as what you do um, in that regard. Yeah, we see the well, we see the market as having settled now. A year ago, it was really hard to tell what's going to happen. I think it's settled in terms of the big LOMs. They have now been established. The um, uh, the Claude models and the chat GPT open AI models and Gemini and so on. So there's five or six main models and they're now at that point where the law of diminishing returns is happening. They can't really train it any better. They uh, Initially it was exponential when they would do a retraining exercise on trillions of data points. Um, it got better and better but the, the returns are very low now. So, so those organizations are spending now a lot of investment into that next layer of um, of agents in the ecosystem that um, can argue better and that uh, that's got more discretion and it's able to think and so on but that's sort of like settled um, now the the challenge is exactly what you said they want to get closer to an individual business but they cannot they just yeah, don't have that organizational structures around the world so the the market and, and the next five years will be the application builders that sit between the business and these LOMs. Now we're one of those organizations and you, you're one of those organizations where we now um, bring the power of LOMs in a practical way, in a safe way to that. Because what's not always common knowledge, and that's the scary part about this, is LOMs were not does not work like Google works, as an example. Um, so for the viewers, um, when you type in something in, um, you type in uh, a certain phrase in Google, over the years Google has developed an authority model. So they would typically bring up the first page, past the ads, would be pages that they deem to be authoritative. So written by a university or written by a known source and referenced by millions of others. And that's how they rank the results from the top result to the bottom result. Is that it's a propriety that's kept them in business. It's going to be disrupted, but it, it kept them in business for many years because they had the principle of authority. So typically the first article is going to be something by a university or by a known institution. Whereas LOM does not work like that. They do not have the principle of authority. It's a, it's a peer vector by similarity search, which is quite scary. You could very easily get an answer that a Chinese blogger wrote if it was trained and it had the right, right similarity vectors, you, um, and, and that's the scary part because people blindly trust ChatGPT, and very often it is spot on, it is really good. Um, but um, they don't have the, uh, uh, vectors simply don't work like Google, you don't have the, the, the authority score in an article. And that's why it's so important to build the applications next to this, where you now take the company's information and you build the, um, you just use the LRM to almost act as a translator, but not as the knowledge base. You use the company as a knowledge base. And I think as people, um, as businesses go on this journey, they'll, they'll discover that the power of the LRM is to understand the intent of the user um, or the customer. But, uh, but in order to do it in a safe, responsible way, it has to be curated data. Um, so 
our foundation was from day one, it has to be curated data. So part of our platform would be to train that company's data. And I think that, that that's now what, what the market is going to evolve. And like you said, the foundational models are brilliant now, and they're doing a lot of development into um, enhancing that ecosystem, um, whereas a lot of the work in the market will happen with the trusted advisors and the trusted application builders in a specific industry. And, and that's very exciting. So your ultimate vision for VectorMind, how would you sort of crystallize that? Yeah, so I think from, from our perspective, we want to make it easy to unlock the power of Gen AI, but in a safe way. So I think that's where we're focusing on is to build applications for specific businesses with specific use cases and doing it in a way that's sustainable. Um, and when I say sustainable, you have to have the right principles and traceability so that um, five years from now, you can continue to build on this. So um, our vision is to really unlock that power for businesses, but without all the inherent risks in that and make it simple to get value out of it. Um, and so far, it's worked really well. We've, um, it, it's actually remarkable how well the adoption has gone for, for us on these projects. Almost every single project that we initiated is live in production somewhere, being used by other staff or customers or members. Um, and that's just the first time I've seen that in technology. So, and I think it's driven by this LLM revolution that just makes stuff easier. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. And I sort of would almost agree is that the traditional resistance you get to new technology within businesses, it doesn't seem to be that way. From an AI point of view, people seem quite open um, for it to help be helping them and sort of assisting them in the ways that it can. Whereas if you implement a new ERP system or mandate some, you know, CRM system to your sales team, there's going to be a lot of resistance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my career has been IoT, CRM systems, really difficult things to implement where there's huge yeah. user resistance um, and organizational resistance and even buying resistance. Yeah. Whereas um, I think the use cases for AI are so practical, it actually helps people. And I mean, there was initially there was a little bit of misconception, I think you mm. would agree with me, where people say, OK, but AI is going to, I mean, it's going to take over people's yeah. work. I think it's settled now in the market. That's not the case. But it is like standing with a chisel, trying to do some mm. earth moving mm. versus getting in a big <laughs> cat truck, yeah. bulldozer, and just bulldozing yeah. it. It's still a driver. It's still the human that's in charge. But you just supercharge the you supercharge the tools and the, and the productivity um, tools that you, that you provide them. And I think that's the difference. So I think the resistance, we haven't seen that. Um, it's, it, it, it's really an interesting journey. I think the price point is important and value is important. Yeah. All of those fundamentals are always important, but, but you're right, the resistance isn't quite there that we saw in previous businesses. And if we had to have this conversation in five years' time, what kind of conversation do you think we'd have? Or like, you know, how would you sort of interpret what's to come and if you had to sort of make a stake on it now? Uh, I think it's a very difficult one because in my entire career, I've never seen anything move this quick. Um, the, uh, in this past week, there was um, a press release that Microsoft and Google are collectively putting $20 billion into additional development for Gen AI, as an example. I mean, we've never, ever seen anything like that. The, the investment by governments, by hyperscalers, by large enterprise, and then by thousands of entrepreneurs and small businesses, just unprecedented. So I think it's almost impossible to predict that. What I, what I do see, however, from my perspective, um, is that everybody will have multiple assistants, um, AI assistants, from healthcare to fitness to personal finance to mentoring, I think every human will have a whole host of assistants. Companies will have hundreds of assistants, very specialized on certain tasks to supercharge productivity. And I think that's going to be, and I think it has the potential to do a lot of good. Um, we launched uh, an app for a company called Akades in Malawi. Now, it's a non-profit and they only service um, small holding farmers and they, um, they really at the bottom of the, um, of the economical um, uh, uh, market in terms of just the kind of people that they're trying to empower. Um, and Gen AI has now brought what they call extension services, which is the, the old advisors to farmers, closer to those individual small older farmers 
in the provinces in Malawi in their local language of Chichewa. That is what this is going to bring about. I think it's going to democratize information and access to information in ways that was previously not even possible to even fathom. So <clears throat> I think the unlock for individuals is just going to be huge. I think that companies and humans will, all of us will have, we will be surrounded by bots and assistants that makes our life better, that makes our, us healthier, that makes us more productive. And hopefully all of that brings about positive change. So it's going to be, it's most definitely a new era. It's, it's the intelligence era where you can consume intelligence quicker and you get things that make intelligent decisions for you. I think it is a step change in humanity. Um, and our part in it, we will see with time because it's moving really quick. And, and I think if we can make it practical and easy for people to use it in businesses, that will be, that will be our mission. Andre, thank you so much for your time. And we'll chat again soon. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Oculus, for, for this podcast. It's a pleasure. You've been watching the Insights Overflow podcast, and I'll catch you on the next one.